<laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for coming to our presentation this afternoon. Um, we're so grateful to have David Hertz here and this program is um, done jointly with the Meritai Retiree Relations Center at UCLA, the, UC Reti the UCLA Retirees Associate, sorry, the UCLA Retirees Association and the UCLA Meritai Association. So thank you to Michael Heafy and Stephen Cederbaum for putting this on. So I'll turn it over to Steve um, for a few words. Well, okay. Or, Michael. Well, Michael I, to go first? No, no, I'll do it. Uh, uh, David, I, it's so exciting to have you here. Uh, it was Diane Childs, one of our members who first suggested you as the speaker. And, and then I, I got a look at your bibliography and, and or biography and decided that, that you could read from Beowulf and it would be interesting and exciting. <laughs> I, I certainly hope that you don't plan to do that, however. <laughs> but but uh, David is, if, in, if we had to do it in one word, he's an environmental architect, but that short phrase uh, so under describes uh, what he's done and the awards that he's gotten um, that I'm really afraid to do this, but Certainly, I'll, I'll talk about the great award that he got, and that was the X Prize for uh, for uh, portable energy uh, that he won in 2019. Uh, this is a very prestigious award, but it only is a capstone to a career of very imaginative uh, work in environmental architecture. Uh, he's been recognized uh, in so many ways. His work has been featured in a number of publications and shows. He's been asked to lecture um, uh, widely. And, and um, I, I imagine, uh, David, that you would be a wonderful guest at a cocktail party. But so, so without any further ado, I would like to welcome you as a speaker and um, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation and please take it away. Great. Well, thank you all for uh, inviting me. I'm happy to do it. There, UCLA plays a long history in our family. I, both my parents are UCLA alums. My father, uh, when there was still a Redwood Grove where the uh, Jant Steps are. So uh, I grew up just a couple blocks from UCLA on Dalehurst Avenue. Mm. And uh, so basically UCLA was my backyard. And then I, I uh, been teaching. Uh, I did my AA at UCLA while uh, attending the Southern California Institute of Architecture and then uh, taught for about 20 years through the ARC ID program at UCLA, um, the extension, which is why I think I know Diane Childs from those days. And I've been teaching on ecology and architecture. Um, my background really started off more as an environmentalist before I realized at a young age that I wanted to be an architect and had to rationalize my place in the world uh, between caring for the environment and being involved with buildings, which is generally destructive to the environment. So how do I lessen the impacts of the built environment on the natural has been kind of a fundamental part of my, my architecture. And so what I'd like to do is share my screen and um, I can go to a little bit of a visual presentation on some of the work that that we've been doing and ask if you can all see the screen and hear me okay yes great yes. um so yes um i i've had a varied practice as an architect uh started in 1983 i worked with the architect john lautner who worked with frank lloyd wright and then i worked for frank geary before opening my own practice i had worked in construction was fascinated with concrete as a material and invented a, a band cement based composite that used materials extracted from the waste stream um, as a decorative aggregate. Things like recycled plastic and, and records and cassettes and electronic components and buttons and zippers. And I found no shortage of things that are off fall that fall onto the ground of a factory or not used, I would add it into the concrete, I grind it down. And so I had an idea, I developed a material 
I went through the testing standards that didn't exist. Uh, it became a product. I manufactured it, licensed it, and then ultimately sold it to a, a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company right in 2006 before the recession. And then they kind of just shelved the technology uh, and it didn't see, it hasn't seen light of day again. Um, I've been focusing our work on uh, the studio environmental architecture. Uh, our scale of work varies from something as small as a trophy for the World Surfing League, which combined the sand of, of 42 years of, of professional athletes, 80 athletes from uh, 40 women, 40 men, um, that I asked to collect the sand from their beaches of origin from all over the world, mixed it in with the pewter to a launch control facility that we're doing currently for Elon Musk at Cape Canaveral for SpaceX. It's a five story high uh, launch uh, control and, uh, and kind of public viewing area. And then in the lower right, you'll see uh, my 747 wing house. That is a project that I realized in Malibu several years ago. Um, I used the wings uh, and upper, fuselage, upper uh, tail uh, stabilizer sections. Uh, of a 747. And there are thousands of, of airplanes desiccating in the desert and obs of obsolescence in California. And I was really interested in the idea of a radical reuse and repurposing rather than bringing uh, new virgin materials and mining them, extracting, transporting them, you know, a lot of which doesn't fit, ends up in waste. Uh, it was a large less strategy where I took uh, these large wings used a helicopter and dropped them on site. And, um, and so it was, you know, I had to deal with 17 governmental agencies, including Homeland Security, when we were inquiring too much about the structural properties of a 747 to uh, FAA. So it's not called in as a downed aircraft site. So some things outside of normal kind of architectural bounds. And our work week, consider regenerative. And that is that sustainability is kind of providing for the needs of the present without detracting from future generations. But we've already done a lot of damage to our planet and we have to do more than be less bad. And so the idea that we have to regenerate and do better uh, is, is, is kind of part of that, uh, that ethos. Uh, the upper left-hand image here is a current project I'm doing for uh, Heal the Bay Aquarium on the Santa Monica Pier. And so the, the form of the building has a, a kind of overt um, kind of um, uh, animalistic shape like a, like a jellyfish. Um, and it's comprised of recycled plastic bottles and marine debris with, with using the uh, kind of a reactive lighting that reacts to the tide. And so there's, there's a connection between the tide going up and down and the movement of the tide and the lighting on the building, which um, represents kind of bioluminescence in you know, some of the marine species. And then on the lower right here, uh, I'm redoing the, Natural Resources Defense Council building in Santa Monica, which was the first lead platinum building in the country. And, um, and I designed a floating translucent solar canopy and a, uh, expanding the whole roof as a usable outdoor space for working um, and for, the, for public events and for uh, events of the NRDC. The building's a net positive energy building, meaning that it generates more energy than it uses and puts that back into the grid. It also creates a habitat, collects its own water, turns the gray water from the building into potable water. Um, and so there's a lot of innovative systems. And then the photo on the upper right is a project that I recently completed on the island of Beckway and the uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and it's a prefabricated aluminum structured building where the roofs folded up, they're tensile membranes, and they're designed to capture water into uh, the columns that bring it into the base. So 
it's an indoor outdoor kind of uh, series of, of buildings. And um, so that's a little about the architecture. We're doing lots of different projects on the architecture side, but I got very interested in water. Um, and and in Ve my office is in Venice, right off the Venice boardwalk. There's, you know, we've had our last drought was a six year sustained drought, but we're perpetually in drought because water comes from long distances in California. And I incorporated a, a mural uh, in street art in my alley, put in a bottle filling station, used solar energy to generate atmospheric water and gave it away to the public for free. The idea is that water should be a fundamental human right, that it's about the democratization of the commons, that maybe water shouldn't be privatized by corporations and sold to us, you know, at high high price points or in little plastic bottles, where more plastic in the oceans exist than plankton. Um, the only issue is that I I was generating over 150 gallons of fresh water a day, more than what the homeless could use or the public could use. So I worked with a nonprofit called Safe Place for Youth in Venice that takes kids aged out of the foster care program. They pick up the water, and they water. 88 urban farm boxes in the Oakwood section of Venice. Um, and because no one would really adopt those, dur especially during the drought, and they continue to grow food for the public um, using our, our, our water. Uh, and then along came the X Prize. And that, as, as you may know, the X Prize um, was set up as an in incentive prize. Uh, much in the way that 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 the uh, uh, Charles Lindbergh's uh, flight was was actually an incentive competition. Many people don't realize that that's that's what generated that kind of um, inertia to really create some global challenges. And so the X Prize was founded in the same ways with people like Elon Musk and others to uh, address global challenges. And this global challenge was to make water out of air and to extract 2000 liters of it in 24 hours. Uh, but it had to be done at a cost of no more than two cents per liter. And it had to be um, used 100% renewable energy source. It was a two year arc of competition. And uh, there were over 100 teams um, from 27 countries. And what was interesting about it is that we were actually not admitted to the final leg of the race. Um, we, we were um, out of the race, about three months elapsed. Other people that made it to the finals were given money and, and time, and then they couldn't perform. And so then we were invited back into the race in progress without the advantage of that three months and, and the monies that they had already received. So it gave me a tremendous amount of, um, of kind of um, vigor to compete at a very high level and take advantage of our kind of stealth uh, anonymity because nobody really knew that who we were. And I built this contraption. I, I ended up not having time to fundraise. So I ended up mortgaging my, my ranch in Malibu um, uh, for $1.5 million and use that money to build these, uh, this machine and to compete. Um, and I put together a team of unlikely people, um, a lot of Burning Man people, um, some Stanford and uh, one guy who was kicked out of Stanford because his dorm burned down when he was experimenting with, um, with uh, energy from biomass gasification, um, a couple Berkeley people up in, and we did this all in Berkeley. Uh, we, we've won some other awards subsequently, uh, uh, world changing ideas for the developing world, uh, social entrepreneurship, and then just a couple months ago, the time best invention of 2020. But, you know, it's not about the awards. It's about all of us in our generation are thinking about future generations. And I just turned 60 and, and you know, I've been 
teaching, as I said, on ecology, architecture, and all the signposts that we anticipated happening are coming faster and faster and earlier and earlier with more severity. And we have a planetary crisis. Um, and the question is, how are we gonna feed and provide water and provide energy to a large percentage of our world? And that's gonna create a massive threat multiplier uh, as people compete for, for resources. And so that's, that's the mission is to try to leave the world a little bit better than we found it. Water, of course, is, is probably first in a hierarchy of needs, maybe second to air. And, but the United Nations estimates that, that fresh water is gonna, uh, demand is gonna outstrip supply by 40% in the next 10 years. It's also a tremendous opportunity. And so we're looking at this is, is the kind of, how do you do well by doing good model? And so I've been analyzing the global impacts for potable water, looking at areas of, uh, which is constantly changing, but areas of extremely high baseline water stress. And the, you know, the short of it is, is that water came here from outer space. It's this in form of ice, it melted. It, it doesn't go anywhere. You know, it, it, it stays within our, our planetary system, but it changes its state from a frozen state to a liquid water state and to a vapor state. But, but unfortunately, a lot of our groundwater is being usurped at a faster rate than the hydrological cycle can put it back in. And the hydrological cycle is being radically altered with the you know, meandering jet stream and other things as a result of climate change. So weather patterns are changing this. So water is unevenly distributed. We're trying to overlap these maps with where there's peace, where there's a kind of a GNP that, that allows for an e economics around water. Um, and, and interestingly, if we think about it from a scarcity model, less than 1% of all the water on, on the planet is fresh water. That's just a, a staggering uh, amount, uh, you know, but and even that less than 1% is unevenly distributed. But at any given time in vapor form, there's six times more water in the atmosphere than all the rivers. So, you know, it's kind of a mindset that we're moving from kind of a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. And this has largely been inspired by Peter Diamandis and um, he, who's, one, who's one of the co-founders of the X Prize and some of his books and writings, one of the books is called Abundance. And, and, and it, it supposes that perhaps the human species at this point has just not been smart enough to think about the way in which we've used the planet's resources and that there is abundance. It's just that, that you know, we've used kind of an inefficient model so far. And, and so, um, so it's, it, you know, our technologies exist within these systems. And I, I use systems thinking to think about this. And I try to use nature-based systems. So if we take old dinosaurs underground and we just burn them and put them in the, it's a linear process that has a series of negative uh, feedbacks, right? And um, so what we're trying to do is in, in, use, in nature, waste equal food. You know, there, there's a, a certain balance. There's billions of years of research and development to perfect, you know, what, you know, the balance of, 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 of uh, planetary systems and, and, and the ecologies within it and how they work. And so we're working within the hydrological cycle in terms of water vapor, but we're also working in the carbon cycle in the way in which we're trying to decarbonize. Because in the next eight to 10 years, we're likely to face 1.5 Celsius, which is the tipping point at which it's no longer, we're no longer really able to control the consequences um, of, of, of climate change. And so there's this amazing pressure to kind of get back on track with joining the world in how do we reduce our carbon emissions. And, I'll, and, and so we exist within these two cycles, but also at the nexus of food, water, and energy, which is what affects humans. And so I invented this device called the WeDo, 
uh, which stands for Wood to Energy Deployable Emergency Water. It uses the alchemical symbols of earth, uh, fire, and air to make water. And um, basically, the idea is that it's a containerized system that in its steady state uh, offers self-reliance. And if you think it, it's really antithetical to our, the way that we think about where our electricity is, where our water comes from, which is a very large central infrastructure, which is very expensive, very slow moving, not adaptive to, to climate change and very vulnerable to, um, to system failure or, or sabotage. Or, um, and whereas if you have redundant distributed systems, it's inherently more climate resilient. And it could also swarm to uh, address emergency response. Uh, so the way that we're doing this using the systems approach is we're using biomass. Now biomass could be like any of the 200 million standing dead trees we have in California or a lot of the nut, uh, you know, we're one of the largest nut producers. I, I like to say California does generate a lot of nuts as in crazy people for sure. Uh, but, but also nuts as in walnuts and pistachio nuts and those shells that are generally a waste product. All of those things, whether it's coconuts in an India, in a uh, island nation or in India uh, for rice husk, we generally produce a lot of biomass and it's a waste problem. Well, all that biomass is absorbing atmospheric carbon in its life, but it's also absorbing things like methane and hydrogen, which are volatiles. And so what uh, we do is we chip up that material, we dry it so that we extract the moisture out of it. We recircle, recirculate that into a kind of tropical rainforest in a box. Then that dry material goes into the small scale biomass gasification process. That uses a, a process called pyrolysis. It basically vaporizes that material and liberates those volatiles that it had absorbed uh, in, into a gas. And that gas, just like instead of um, diesel or, or, or natural gas, runs into an a generator and that creates power and we create power at about 10 times the cost and area of solar. And that's one of the reasons that we could win the X prize is that nobody could make the economics work when you needed so much solar and you only had say five or six hours of light. We have 24 hours that we could generate power and we can create a power density at 10 times greater. So imagine one solar panel 250 watts, five hours a day, we're making 25,000 watts, you know, 24 hours a day. The byproduct for every kilowatt of electricity is, is two kilowatts worth of thermal energy, that is heat, as a waste. And so the, what we do with the heat is we do a series of thermal conversion processes where we collide it against a cooler temperature and we condense it to make water called vapor distillation. Um, but we also can use that heat or, or extract that heat to make cooling. And the byproduct is biochar, which is essentially imagined as a kind of sky carbon. We're taking that CO2 that would have been liberated by that plant material in the atmosphere and instead sequestering it into this biochar. And the biochar is a very interesting beneficial material for soil revitalization. If you go through pre-Columbian archeology, span you still see a kind of form of biochar in uh, the soil environment. It lasts a long time. It has an affinity for water retention and beneficial bacteria and decomposition um, like in a co-composting environment. And so, so it's really a virtuous cycle. That's that's what we're interesting. The, the idea that we're, we're getting essentially decentralized solution, but we're also creating a new form of local commerce and resilience and empower communities for social change. So there is a, kind of a, an emerging uh, art of, of atmospheric water generation to meet these needs. In fact, this week, 
General Electric just invested $20 million into an with Indian research and development uh, to address that for the DARPA, for the military. But um, they're, the state of the art is basically their glorified air conditioners. They use the vapor compression cycle with compressors. They have a high appetite for energy. They require hot and humid ambient environment and they use ozone depleting refrigerants. And what I sought to do is to change that. So we make more energy than we know what to do with. Uh, we make our own microclimates or so agnostic as to local climate and we sequester atmospheric carbon and don't use refrigerants. It's a it's containerized and in disused shipping containers. They can be broken into pods. So where we have an energy pod and a storage pod and a water pod and a refrigeration pod. And so to collectively, this, this kind of magic box, if you will, these, these can do everything from food dehydration to, of course, making heating, cooling, help agriculture. If you have power in a remote location, you could add internet. You know, we have a convergence happening now where we have, um, we have a wide scale um, uh, internet, global internet distribution through satellite uh, converging with 5G and the spatial web to, you know, basically provide the access for internet, uh, which could also lead to global learning and other things in the developing world. Um, and so, so essentially you, we have a, a battery pod that's made out of uh, repurposed electric car batteries that are hot swappable. So when we're making all this energy, we could store it in batteries and then we can make water uh, with the water pot and then we could also do re have refrigeration and that supply cold storage supply chain is very important especially for the small shareholder farmer or for disaster relief uh, it can be rapidly deployed in these small shipping containers and uh, for disaster relief or a lease model or rapidly deployed in the case of emergency so let's say one island has a, a hurricane uh, and there are on all these other islands, they could quickly swarm to address uh, uh, a climate emergency. And so uh, this, is, this is based on this concept of anti-fragility. The idea with anti-fragility is that, okay, if you think about you know, the human body and our muscles, you know, if, we, if, we, if we use stress to build muscle, um, not too much stress, but it, but enough stress to build stress muscles. But then the stressor is a good thing. If it, you know, if you if you the tree has to kind of move and have some stress in order to build its fiber strength. Those are examples of systems that actually do better with stress. And so a lot of what I'm interested in is that we're in an age of resilience, and we're going to need systems that actually can do better with stress. So think about a hurricane. You have a, a lot of biomass that's wet. You have a need for energy, you have a need for water, you, know, you have a need for refrigeration, but you need it to be rapidly deployable. And so after the XPRIZE win, we um, built a containerized system. We brought it to the Oakland Convention Center and we powered uh, the whole convention center, a conference there called Verge. And, um, and provide a water. We, we recently did a small water pod that we brought to Paramount Studios for the um, Visioneering, XPRIZE Visioneering Conference and, uh, and provided water out of this water kiosk. And then I've been restoring this property up in uh, Malibu that we call Xanabu that was built uh, originally by Tony Duquette from sets from Hollywood that were repurposed. Um, you can see this little kind of pagoda structures made out of satellite dishes and wire spools and paint cans and old umbrellas and 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 so it obviously philosophically follows some of my interest in what we take make and waste from our society um, and we have the uh, we do functioning under a California Energy Commission grant um, using Woolsey fire uh, mitigation materials to um, 
to heat a building, cool a building, um, and um, provide water, biochar, and we have excess heat that we dump into a pool. The biochar is being used in a regenerative agricultural system. We're planting a lesser known species. We have about 550 coffee trees that have been, uh, we're working with U UC Davis um, geneticists that have hybridized the Panamanian coffee to grow uh, that doesn't have any known pests like the citrus and avocado that's more climate resilient. Um, and, and so part of what this is all about is impact and what kind of some impact we can make. So we can make impacts in reducing biomass. We can make impacts in creating energy, rural electrification and, or in the peri-urban interfaces, cities swell and their populations swell to outgrow the infrastructure. We can sequester carbon and we can make water. Um, and we use the sustainable development goals, these SDG goals that the UN has developed uh, and we address all uh, 17 goals in some, some capacity. And we ultimately see these, especially in the developing world as these resilience hubs. This would be a place where people go within a small geography um, that they can get battery storage, they can get water, they can get refrigeration, they could be engaged in use of internet and charging. Um, for the last mile, we see this resilience cart that would be able to bring the mobile power and a battery to do a battery exchange or to uh, offer, once you have a battery, you can do induction cooking. So you don't have to chop down a tree to make charcoal, to cook over an open flame to die prematurely. Um, and so we've been analyzing different areas around the world and what would be ideal case studies and how we can meet their needs. Um, and we've, we've kind of been looking at an economic model that would be based on impact investment from family offices and from uh, foundations, not really a private equity or venture capital model, but it's a, it does have a return on its investment and a recurring revenue stream. So the fund basically buys the we do's so that their communities don't have any first cost. And then the community sells, you know, the, the instruments of service, of water and electricity, et cetera. They generate a profit, they pay back a lease back into the fund and then that fund can, uh, have a recurring revenue model that it then uh, ex, you know, uses exponential kind of growth to, to expand. So one we do operating about half capacity can generate enough water for about 8,500,000 people offset about 2 million pounds of carbon. Um, and so we've been just kind of looking at these different models uh, of where, you know, where we can go around the world and, um, and that's kind of moving, you know, I still have an architecture practice and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in the restoration of, of kind of um, the Tony Duquette thing. I'm also rebuilding Paramount Ranch, which my grandfather and father built part of the National Park Service, the Western town, which was lost in uh, the Woolsey fire. And so I'm, I'm interested and engaged in a couple different areas. Um, but there's a commonality between the concerns around kind of sustainability regeneration. Um, but I, I'm perhaps most um, most inspired by you know how we could bring water to people that need it most. And uh, with that, I'm happy to kind of open open this up to to any questions, conversations. Thank you, David. Um, let me see this. If you have any questions, feel free to either raise your hand, your real hand or your virtual hand, um, or you can type it in the chat. Okay. Question. How does this uh, integrate with uh, some of the stuff that Bill Gates Foundation has been doing that was um, profiled on Netflix's Inside Bill's Brain? 
Yes, a good question and something we certainly plan to uh, to integrate. Um, what what the Gates Foundation has been very interested in is how do they address sanitation primarily, and um, and so that but it's a very similar. They're they're working on a on a kind of a containerized. Uh, uh, sanitation facility to process black waste mm -hmm. and to treat it and but they're not generating energy to do that they would require energy from some source like probably self-sustaining according, well, according to the documentary it was um, part of the what do I want to call it the uh, requirements were that it had to be self-sustaining it couldn't require outside water, couldn't require outside energy. Had to get it all from, from the waste. Right, but it's, but it's not um, making say excess energy or it's not making water, Correct. it's not making refrigeration, it's not sequestering carbon. So, I mean, it's, it's doing some great things. We're not, we're not processing waste. So it's actually complementary, you know, if, and I exactly. think that there's, yeah, there's there's a lot of synergies between mm -hmm. that because, you know, but there are also a lot of corollaries in human health, obviously, between clean water and and human waste. So I, I think that they actually work very well together. And, you know, we hope uh, to have the opportunity to kind of present that as a mm -hmm. complementary component. Yeah, it does produce water. That was kind of his main uh, focus on this thing was is that people were dying from diarrhea and it boiled down to they just didn't have uh, clean, clean water. drinking water. So his, I, his initiative was how do we address this problem in a economical way that it has to be self-sustaining, has to be small enough, you can't replumb the world. Um, in regards to sewer systems, uh, you have to get something out of it that is uh, reusable. I know that they did get the water out of it. I don't know what they do with the solid pellets that came behind. I don't know if they use those for fuel or what. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I think there's, there's obviously perceptional um, barriers, you know, especially in the developed world to kind of toilet to tap, you know, is a very <laughs> unappetizing uh, concept that you have to get over. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it is interesting. Okay. And Dean Kamen also, there was a documentary called Slingshot, if uh -huh. you're interested. Um, you know, Dean Kamen has, you know, like 500 patents and, and, uh, and he invented the dialysis machine. He used, he used okay. part of that idea too. How do we take essentially dirty water and how do we turn it into clean water? And it's a very similar system where you're, you're basically taking in dirty water. Um, he wasn't using black water as, as the Gates Foundation is. Yeah. You know, they're basically taking, uh, you know, sewage, which is, has a lot of water in it and they're mm -hmm. extracting the water and then purifying the water. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Okay, there's a question in the chat about um, the biggest obstacle making WEVEW successfully international. Great, yeah. I mean, there's there's obviously obstacles. I mean, just logistical obstacles, um, ongoing maintenance, you know, and support obstacles, but also cultural obstacles. I mean, we, you know, we're we're trying. We're working with local nonprofits and people on the ground. We're working, for instance, with the United Nations World Food Program in Uganda in a refugee camp. So, uh, you know, we have the logistics kind of handled through the U UN, but also it's really important for us to, um, you know, understand the culture um, uh, and not impose our kind of white privileged view, what we think a culture will want, but more uh, really have people that understand it. So one example is, you know, one nonprofit I was speaking to that puts wells in communities, they were specifically trying to address women who, and women and girls who are often charged with walking, you know, six to 10 kilometers a day, 
for water that are subject to victimization. They put a well in the community for them. The well got vandalized. So who would vandalize, you know, a well that's providing water for the community? Well, it turned out that it was the women vandalizing the well so that they can get their time away from the men to, to walk for water. <laughs> yeah. You know? And and so that's you know makes makes sense when you think about it from that standpoint. Or, you know, so there so there are a lot of things, you know, I think obstacles are gonna be learning about sometimes there's there's such desperation that someone would take something that even if this device is working and producing, you know, water and producing money, that the desperation might be so high that it could just be stolen and taken apart and sold for parts for, you know, an immediately short-term gain. Um, and there's also disruption to, to uh, kind of like uh, little mafiosos around things like charcoal or, you know, and, and, or, or water trucking, you know, there's many barriers to, to, to entry because it's a disruptive system. When you're giving people autonomy, you're disrupting, you know, the corporations and politics that are involved in controlling those resources. So those are some of the vulnerabilities that we expect. Okay, I, I have a question. Is there a downside to water extraction from the atmosphere? Uh, some, something akin to ozone layer depletion? Good question. And that shows the kind of system thinking idea. What, are the, what is the causality? We have not found any, any negative things. So sometimes people are saying, well, what happens if you start extracting all this humidity? Are you going to create dehumidification? And we actually had um, a colleague of mine, a Nobel laureate climatologist at RAND, um, analyzed that, you know, and he basically said that there's no way that, you know, if every single building and every single person had an atmospheric water generator, that that you could extract enough humidity that wouldn't be replenished, you know, from the environment, right? Because nature abhors a vacuum. The ocean is, and all plants are evapotranspiring every single day. There's just not enough impact. And it doesn't have any effect on the ozone because it's not, um, doesn't use any ozone depleting refrigerants. Um, so, but, you know, so, I mean, it would take, it would take a very strange little microclimate where you could affect, affect the humidity. Um, but, but, we don't anticipate that that would be an issue. And, and, and the other corollary that was interesting is that if you have water, you're, you could have landscape. If you have landscape, you increase humidity, right? Because all that, all that is, is liberating through evapotranspiration in the environment. So we, like what we found was that, that the drought, um, you know, in say, um, the desert communities like Palm Springs and so forth, when they when they stopped watering all the the uh, golf courses and irrigation, had this kind of um, this consequence of actually reducing the humidity, further drying things out. There's some more questions in the chat about. Um... Is the system adaptable to urban environments? Would it be too intrusive to the normal street activity? And what about water reclamation, reclaiming what working to in concert with these urban environments? Yeah, so, you know, these are, are a little bit more rural based. Uh, I mean, they could go in an urban environment, but like at a greenway site, for instance, where you would already be collecting all the, green waste and you'd be processing it and you needed power, that makes sense. But it wouldn't really be practical in this uh, sense to you know, have it like next to your home in a small residential area or next to your building right there and then transporting biomass you know, to that location probably wouldn't make sense. But it makes a lot of sense in a, in a rural and, and, and uh, you know, or in a area like in a park or a school or a fire state, you know, somewhere that was kind of semi commercial industrial. 
to it. Okay. Uh, would um, it be usable in areas of the country that say the Appalachian area? Sure. I mean, there'd be a lot of biomass and um, it's fairly rural. Um, and even if, and it wouldn't really matter if it was cold or dry. In fact, if it's cold, it even makes more water because, you know, the, of the, of the contrast between the heat and cold. Um, Condensation in the air. Yes. You, you know, you have less ability when, the, you know, that's why you get so dry out when it's so cold, there's mm -hmm. less ability for, there's less available moisture in the air when it's cold, the, there's more moisture in the air when it's hot and that's you know we make these kind of superheated environments where there's more air or i mean more water in the air but when you collide that against the cold uh you you would get a lot of condensation so you could use it there how about that you mentioned golf courses um one of the major expenses on a golf course is water to keep the thing green um, yeah, we've looked into it. To help off offset the use of water. Um, the issue with um, something like that for landscape irrigation or for agriculture, for that matter, mm -hmm. is that they just use too much volume of water to what we could really make sense for us. And it's not the highest and best use. Like you would be better off using like a like a gates thing or a gray water system or storm water, you know, like a lower grade water for irrigation than a higher grade, you know, drinking water. Uh, right. Because we just, we just, we just don't make enough volume to make a measurable difference. You know, California is about 70% of our water use is agriculture and about 18% of our energy budget is pumping water. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, people don't often see that energy water nexus. So, so yeah, it would, you know, it wouldn't really make sense for, for irrigation. Um, um, there is another question in the chat about how many of these we do units do you have in operation now and where are they? I have uh, two uh, fully functioning. I, I have, uh, one up in Berkeley and one in uh, Malibu at uh, SkySource Ranch where we're operating under these uh, California Energy Grants and a CAL FIRE grant. Okay, so they're, they're pretty much local to California at this point. They are. Okay. We haven't really uh, done the global deployment. We're in a, in a kind of um, productization phase on our roadmap to building case studies, getting funding to then do the global deployment models. And so, uh, the Ugandan project is 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 one we're working on. Uh, Island Nation project, uh, India. So we're planning to have them in the kind of the major continents, and then uh, within the next year or so, uh, and then getting feedback and learning from how they work. Well, it's kind of depicted in the the photo behind you, David. Uh, looks like an more desert-like environment, would you consider New Mexico or West Texas or some other um, U.S. locations that are underserved water-wise? Yeah, we, we're definitely looking at uh, U.S. first, um, both you know, so we can kind of progress our technology in a little bit more accessible way, and in particular, First Nations, which are which are um, the, the reservations that, that First Nations are on are often very underserved. And even with, especially with COVID, even worse. Um, and there does seem to be quite a bit of biomass in some of these areas. I think the, the problem would be if you're in a complete desert environment, um, there may not be biomass that's locally available. But, but it doesn't matter what the, in, environment, the ambient temperature or humidity is because we're making our own, but we need biomass. And so, so a couple examples to put it in context is in the, in the Ugandan refugee camp, there's a steady supply of biomass because it comes in the form of pallets and crates, wood pallets and crates that just come every single day with all the food supplies. These are like 200,000 people. And um, there's a wood shop that uses a diesel generator to generate power. 
to make things out of the wood and they have scrap because they need power. Um, obviously they could benefit by water and, um, and heat for drying and other and cooling and they have wood. Another, another small entity is in the Philippines where they're making coconut uh, water plantations and they have um, a need for energy water refrigeration and they have coconuts so those are the kind of models ideally where we're where the biomass is you know it starts to break down when you have to start transporting biomass okay um another question is how do you maintain and keep the units secure in a village a city or just out in the urban uh sorry rural spaces Sure. Well, they're in the shipping containers, which are, are pretty effectively, uh, you know, I mean, someone could take a cutting torch and theoretically get in, you know, try to break locks. But, but you know, the basic container is, is, is strong, but also we intend to have them in places like schools or hotels or other places that, you know, have security and have some kind of containment and ideally they should be functioning at almost all hours as a key like a kiosk to, to meet the needs of the community if, need, if necessary. Um, another question is how long does it take to set up the equipment on a site? Um, well because it's containerized um, it's basically all it's just dropped and uh, dropped on site opened up and it could it could start immediately and you know there needs to maybe be some training and so there would be it but but they could it could start immediately training for both operation and maintenance of the equipment inside correct and so that's you know part of what we have to really work on is the kind of you know process manuals and and technical support that could you know provide the training and also provide a kind of supply chain for parts and things of that sort. Um, now, another side question is, um, there's uh, a lot of, we think a lot of nonprofits would be interested in we do. Is, how is your message getting out to them and to the rest of the world? Right now, um, it's mainly through things like, you know, the X Prize or the time you know, invention through kind of um, publicity. We're not actively um, uh, reaching out necessarily. It's been more reactive to opportunities around around the media and just speaking with people like you that, you know, think it's a good idea mentioned to somebody. So, um, but, but we do see nonprofits as our primary target audience because they have the infrastructure on the ground. They understand the culture and the climate, and we think they can provide the most the most benefit. Sure, those those underserved communities, like the Native Americans, uh, in their very rural areas, could surely use these devices to uh, the best advantage. Right. Um, Someone else have a question? Would you like to address to David? Did I miss if you got the one about we do and the Native Americans in Michigan, especially Flint, Michigan, <laughs> with the water there? Oh. <laughs> There's amazingly, you know, a lot of areas in our in our um, country that have poor water quality. You know, it's not just water quantity. Uh, Flint is obviously an example, but even in LA, if you look at Maywood, they can they they cannot drink their water. Or you look at most of the Central Valley, where most of our food is grown, the water is contaminated from agriculture, the groundwater. So you know there are many many um, areas where water quality is a problem, and it could be used. David, are you um, approaching uh, Biden's administration or the feds about this, this project? We're not actively doing that, but um, we, we hope at some point that, you know, they'll be aware 
of this, you know, through a lot of mutual contacts. Uh, we know a lot of people within the administration at a high level um, that know about the technology. And we, you know, we, we, we know that the, that the will, um, political will is to, you know, one, believe in science and to believe that there's an issue with climate change and there'll be an, a real emergence and investment in new technology. So we're, we're um, you know, very optimistic about that possibility. Would you say you're Biden your time? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Play on words. <laughs> um, there is one more question here. Um, would you welcome contact from nonprofits or do you have a press release that they can access? We have our website at skysource.org, which has, you know, a lot of introductory information. We always welcome nonprofits. You know, we're, we are speaking with them every day uh, and handling inquiries every day from, from people around the world and, and kind of building out our database so that, we, you know, when we have, a, let's say, by a region or by um, a certain technology or need, we'll be able to access that in the future and you know, hopefully match them with funding or maybe they'll have funding themselves. Uh, David, I heard yes. you mentioned uh, Burning Man and of course it wasn't on this year, but did, have you tried this up in Burning Man for the week? So um, yeah, it's a perfect testing ground. I, <laughs> I actually brought a 747 to Burning Man for a couple of years. Um, that was quite an achievement, uh, and um, uh, and we. So the answer to your question is no, we have not. We uh, fully intended to actually this year, and and when it starts again, we probably will. We it's it's a perfect thing for for Burning Man climate because it's a dry desert climate. Exactly. It's it, you know everything has to kind of come in and go out. There's a you know need for for high density power that's being generated by diesel mainly uh, for the short term. There's a need for refrigeration. So, it, you know the only thing is we'd have to bring some biomass in with us, but that's that's not that big of a deal for that week. We probably would just use walnut shells or you know wood chips. Yeah. Well, I I think that uh, we should probably wrap up, Michael. Do you want to? Sure. Uh, David, this is a great, great thing that you guys have been working on. And I'm so amazed at all of the balls you are juggling at the moment with your different projects. So my hat's off to you. And we thank you so much for, uh, and to Diane Childs, thank you for bringing David's uh, show to our attention. We're grateful. One quick, one quick question. Um, it's kind of off the topic of what your uh, this project that you're on now. Have you ever done any rammed earth? I have actually. I, I designed a. Uh, I did rammed earth for my own house for a, for several walls uh, uh -huh. back in the early '90s, and then I designed a house in Malibu all out of rammed earth. But it was using a a, a method called Pizze. Uh, which is more of an acronym for pneumatically impacted stabilized earth. So I did the traditional rammed earth walls mm -hmm. in my house, but then the house in Malibu, um, I did two houses that actually neither got built, um, but they were all rammed earth. And, and it was basically spraying the earth and cement mixture onto a one-sided form. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a little bit different. Yeah. Than the compacted, but there's a lot of economies associated with the pneumatically impacted stabilized earth. There's a Stanford engineer um, professor kind of developed that technique, and and that, that seemed to be one that we can get through the building code uh, mm -hmm. in a more rational way. What is that? Uh, basically, it's 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 um, soil and cement right. that shot okay. like a like you would shoot gunite on a pool. Okay. And so you basically build a form, one-sided form, mm -hmm. instead of two-sided form, so it's half the cost. And then yeah. you shoot it you know, and you build it out that way. How do you control your thickness? 
Um, they actually can just do that by using these these wires, and they just shoot it to the wire and then scrape the whole surface down oh. at that level. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you could look it up. David Easton is uh, is uh, up in up in uh, Napa. Right. Uh, he's kind of the foremost expert, and he wrote wrote a book on on uh, rammed earth. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the info. Sure. Very cool, David. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, look forward, uh, all you who have remained, for another fun-filled after-lunch lecture in March. Uh, this one will be a little more musical-oriented. <laughs> so hang in there. Everybody okay. keep safe. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.